Well, thank you so much. Um, it's really great to be here with all of you. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. I've heard so many wonderful things about St. Albans and have yet to ever make it there, um, but hopefully I will be able to before long. Holy Week is the high point of the church calendar when we are invited to contemplate the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ. And yet it can also be a perplexing season as we're confronted with stories rife with paradox and mystery. This evening, I wanna talk about how theology can help us address this, not by explaining the mysteries away, but by giving us the tools to hold fast to them, to enter into the mystery and come away transformed. The Orthodox theologian, Andrew Lauf, writes that the main concern of theology is not so much to elucidate anything as to prevent us, the church, from dissolving the mystery that lies at the heart of the faith, dissolving it or missing it altogether by failing truly to engage with it. In this spirit, I'd like this evening to discuss key elements of classical Christology, that is the understanding of the person of Christ and his work, in order to deepen our participation in and contemplation of the mystery of Christ. Now the poets are masters of reveling in mystery and paradox. And so I'd like to begin with one of them. Uh, here's the poem Annunciation by the great English poet John Donne. Um, and it says, salvation to all that will is nigh, that all which always is all everywhere, which cannot sin and yet all sins must bear which cannot die, yet cannot choose but die. Lo, faithful virgin yields himself to lie in prison in thy womb. And though he there can take no sin, nor thou give, yet he'll wear taken from thence flesh, which death's force may try. Ere by the spheres time was created, thou wast in his mind, who is thy son and brother, whom thou conceivest conceived. Yea, thou art now thy maker's maker and thy father's mother. Thou hast light in dark and shutst in little room, immensity cloistered in thy dear womb. In this season of Lent, we're called to reflect on the profoundest of truths, the heart of the faith, which at once gives meaning to all that we do as Christians, but also raises difficult questions. When we say that Jesus suffered and died, does that mean, as we often hear on Good Friday, that God suffered and died? If so, what can it possibly mean to speak of the suffering of a God who cannot suffer, or to speak of the death of the eternal one who holds the universe in existence? The Christian tradition confesses that God is immutable, which means that he does not change. Psalm 102 says, but you are the same and your years have no end, and that he is impassable, which means he does not experience suffering because God does not undergo changing intellectual, psychological, or emotional states like we do. What do we do with this in light of the incarnation? As Trevor Hart has written, in Holy Week, we are reminded that our ultimate hope is grounded in the most radical and remarkable thing, the thing that is indeed a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Greeks, the thing that alone finally makes the story of Jesus good news as well as shocking news. That is, of course, the claim that here, uniquely, God himself becomes his own creature, precisely so that indwelling humanity as its proper subject, he may be capable of human actions and passions, because in every respect he is man, the invisible becoming visible, the incomprehensible being made comprehensible, the impassable becoming capable of suffering. Now, maybe we should pause here. Is all this just some fancy footwork on the part of theologians and poets? After all, isn't paradox just another word for nonsense? The fact is that many today assume that the notion of Christ as fully divine and fully human is a contradiction in terms. Take John Hick, for example, who writes, to say without explanation that the historical Jesus of Nazareth was also God is as devoid of meaning as to say that this circle drawn with pencil on paper is also a square. This is, for Hick, a paradox in the sense of being self-contradictory and incoherent. And yet, as Rowan Williams has argued, in being invited to confess Christ as divine and human, we're not being invited to suspend our intellectual faculties and accept a contradiction in the good cause of obedient piety. Indeed, in his estimation, and that of Christian theologians throughout the tradition, this confession is profoundly coherent and its paradoxical nature lies in the fact that it's contrary to expectation. 
as G.K. Chesterton put it, paradox in this sense is the case of truth standing on her head to attract attention. If this is the case, then it may be helpful to unpack some of the Christological grammar that the church has developed to illuminate the coherence of these paradoxical claims and allow us to grasp some of the truth at the heart of the mysteries of the faith. I will do this in three parts. First, a brief outline of the historical development of Christology through the councils of Nicaea and Chalcedon. Second, a consideration of three Christological principles that follow from this tradition. And finally, a consideration of how they might be applied to our reflections during Lent and Holy Week. So let's begin with the councils of Nicaea and Chalcedon. In the early centuries of the church, Christians began to develop ways of specifying what they believed and confessed to be true about Christ. This inevitably involved them in conversations about being an ontology. Who is Christ such that we committed monotheists worship him as we worship the one God? Along the way, some groups developed explanations that dissolved the mystery at the heart of this confession, explaining away the paradox and resolving the tension that confronted them in the Gospels. One such group on the left, known as Docetists, they rightly insisted that God is impassable and immutable, but wrongly concluded that therefore Christ, if he is divine, must have only seemed to suffer and die. This is the word dokeo, docetic means to seem. This stemmed in part from their Gnostic belief that matter was the principle of evil and impurity in the world. And therefore they denied that he was material. So upholding his divinity, they denied his humanity as a mere appearance. Jesus was truly divine, but he was not human. Others on the opposite side, including Ebionites and various adoptionists, rightly insisted to the contrary that Jesus was fully and truly human. Not only was he encountered as a human by all those who met him, but as Gregory Nazianzen would later say, what is not assumed is not healed. And he must have assumed a human nature if we humans are to be saved. However, they could not square this with the confession of Jesus' divinity. So they denied that he was fully divine, suggesting instead that he was adopted by God, probably at his baptism, and given an elevated position because of his holiness as a human person. Now, a third group known as the Arians, this little dot on the left, suggested similarly that Jesus was not truly God, but that he was the highest of all creatures. He was created as a sort of demigod, not on the level of God himself, but above regular humanity. Now, in the year 325, the Council of Nicaea rejected each of these approaches because of the way they dissolved the mystery at the heart of the faith by explaining away one or the other key terms. Instead, the council affirmed the following. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and became man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried and so on. So we hear, here we have a very clear statement that Christ is true God from true God. So as opposed to the, the Ebionites and the adoptionists God and, and the Arians, Christ is, is true God, begotten, not made. He's not a creature, not even a high creature. He's of one being with the Father. And against the Docetists, he was incarnate and became man. He didn't appear to be a man. He didn't inhabit a man. He became man. Um, so this is the, the confession of the Nicene Creed. So Nicaea set boundaries around the mystery of the incarnation that resulted then in further questions. What do we mean when we say that Jesus was fully God of one being with the Father and fully human? Two possible solutions suggested themselves. The Nestorians at the top, much like the Docetists, continued to uphold the impassibility of God, that God cannot suffer, and thus suggested that the divine word, the son of God, dwelled within Jesus, but was not Jesus Christ. In this way, the humanity and divinity remained distinct so that God would not be sullied by the humanity. The problem with their solution was that it results in two persons, two Christs. And whatever the human Christ does, that can only be attributed to the human person and not to the divine son of God. 
This is similar to how the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We remain distinct persons and our actions are still our own, even if they're empowered by divine grace. This isn't what the Nicene Confession means when it says that Christ is divine. The other option at the bottom was monophysitism or Eutychianism. In the incarnation, they said, humanity and divinity fused together into a third thing, that is Jesus. But the problem is that the divine nature is infinite. So nothing can be added to it that could transform it into something else. Plus, if the nature is mixed together to become a third thing, then Jesus would be neither human nor divine, but something else entirely. This too isn't what the Nicene Confession intends. And so in 451, the Council of Chalcedon rejected each of these for dissolving the mystery and denying either the integrity of Jesus' humanity and divinity or the unity of his personhood. Instead, they affirmed the following. We confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhood, also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The properties of each nature are preserved and concurs in one person, not parted or divided into two persons like the Nestorians, but one and the same Son, and only begotten God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. These two councils set helpful boundary markers designed to uphold the mystery of the incarnation. And as long as we avoid the gray area, for there be dragons, there is significant room for contemplation and even creativity in how we come to know and understand the identity of Christ. So now let's turn to three Christological principles that stem from this Nicene Chalcedonian tradition. To begin with, when we talk about Christ as one person with two natures, we're using philosophical terms, person and nature. Um, and so let's consider what those terms mean for this tradition. We begin then with the ancient question of change and continuity in the world. As the ancient philosophers considered reality, one of the first questions that raised for them was whether and how things endure across time and change. Heraclitus suggested that there is nothing constant in the world. Everything is in flux and there is no continuity. He famously said, you can't step in the same river twice. Thus, we cannot talk about stable properties in things. There is nothing but change. Parmenides argued to the contrary that change is an illusion and that reality is unchanging and static. Nothing really changes. Everything just is what it is. Now, Aristotle came along and said, there's both. It's obvious to our senses that change happens. And there's also something that endures in the midst of the change. And this is where we get the concept of nature. A nature is the principle of continuity and development. It's that which endures across change while helping organize the change, right? When we look at the world around us, we see that certain things, certain kinds of things are only capable of certain kinds of change. And they have specific properties that other things don't have. So we look at a puppy dog and we see it develop into a grown dog and into an older dog. Right? It's, going to only, it's only going to undergo certain types of change, and it's going to have properties that determine what that change looks like. So that's a nature. So a nature is not a thing or a substance, they would say, but a principle of a thing's mode of existence. A nature is that in virtue of which a thing has human existence rather than vegetable or canine existence. In other words, a nature is a group of properties that a subject can have, which determine the mode of existence of that thing. They both organize the change that it experiences and they endure in the midst of the change. Well, then a person is the word that we use for things that have natures. A person is the subject of the properties. It's the subject of the act of being that gives existence to its properties. So we can summarize this by saying that persons are subjects of properties and nature's categories pro categorize properties into groups. A person with a certain group of properties belongs to that nature. So when we say that Christ is one person in two natures, we're, what we're saying is that the son of God, the second person of the Trinity is the person or substance or act of being 
which lives and acts in and as and through the human nature of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus says or does something, those actions and words cannot be attributed to anyone else but the Son of God. And he exists in a human mode of being because he possesses the properties of a human nature. So we don't take a human person that already exists and then transform it by adding divine properties to it because that would corrupt the integrity of the human nature. The human nature remains perfectly intact. Christ is fully human. And when we confess his divinity, we don't mean that his humanity has been transformed into something else. Rather, what we mean is that his humanity is the human nature of a divine person. And this divine person's humanity is the principle in virtue of which he lives and acts humanly with the properties, characteristics, and powers proper to humanity, including a human mind and will. To return now to our theme of mystery, we're not saying as theologians that we can explain how God is able to take up a human nature in personal union. We can't explain the mechanism by which this happens or point to other instances as examples. We can't say what it would have felt like to be a divine person existing in a human nature. But we affirm that this is true as a precise exposition of what it means to confess that Jesus is fully God and fully man. The incarnation remains a mystery, but we've clarified more precisely what the mystery is. It is truly the person of the divine son who truly exists as a true man. So this leads us to the second principle. Now we ask questions about the actions of Christ. When Jesus does something, is it his humanity or his divinity at work? The answer for this the classic Christian tradition is to say it's both. When someone acts, their action is an effect produced by the person according to the properties of their nature. So the action originates in the person, and it's a certain kind of action because that person has a specific nature. In the actions of Christ, we say that the divine person, the eternal word, the son of God, acts, and he does so by reason of his human nature. And thus his actions are both fully divine and fully human. They're actions of a divine person in a fully human mode. Now, it's really important to note that at this point, most of us are probably imagining Jesus as a divine mind inhabiting a human body. But that's the Christological error known as Apollinarianism. Apollinarius considered the human mind to be the root of error and thus evil. And so he contended that the human mind of Christ was replaced by a divine mind. Oops, sorry. But for Jesus to be fully human, he must possess a human soul, a human mind, a human will. We would add today a human consciousness, though that term is complicated. Um, Gregory Nazianzen, the great fourth century patristic theologian, put this pithily. He said, if anyone puts trust in him as a man without a human mind, truly they are bereft of mind and undeserving of salvation. For what is not assumed cannot be healed. So Apollinarianism is just a sophisticated form of monophysitism, where Jesus' two natures are being mixed together to form a third thing that's neither fully divine nor fully human. And so the Christian tradition said, no, Christ has a human mind, right? These two natures stay fully intact. So the way that a lot of the classical Christological tradition guards against this is by talking about Christ's humanity as an instrument of his divinity. And this allows them to explain two things. It allows them to specify that Christ's humanity should act according to its own properties, which means it should have rational, willful action. And it allows them to specify how Jesus' human nature can participate in an act that exceeds its natural capacities, such as acts of healing or redemption. In other words, his divine operation employs the human and his human operation shares in the power of the divine. So if we think of an ax as an instrument, we can note that the action of chopping wood is something that an ax and a craftsman do together. The action of chopping originates in the craftsman, but it takes the form that it does because of the properties of an ax. So by analogy, we can say that the humanity of Christ is an instrument of the divine person, such that his every action originates in the eternal word, but it takes the form that it does because of the properties of the human nature. But there are two important differences between an ax and Jesus' human nature. 
First, whereas an act is entirely separate from the craftsman, and therefore its action can be distinguished from that of the craftsman to some degree, Christ's humanity is a conjoined instrument. It's fully united to the primary agent in personal union. So its action is not distinct from the action of the principal agent, even while it retains its proper operation through its own nature. And second, whereas the ax is an inanimate instrument, the human nature is a free rational instrument and it's acted on in such a way as to act. It's unique to God that he can act in things in such a way that he does not undermine their freedom through his action. Again, this is an area of mystery for us. We have no experience of using a free rational instrument. We're just affirming that this is the case without explaining how it happens. And this, by the way, has important implications for thinking more broadly about divine sovereignty and free will, grace and nature, and so on, right? God doesn't exist in a competitive relationship to creatures such that his action takes away from the action of the creature. And that's why he's able to, in the incarnation, take up a human nature and act within it in such a way that it upholds the freedom of that nature. So because an action is twofold, according to the principles of the instrument or the nature and the movement that originates in the person, the instrument can participate in a higher action than would otherwise be possible for it. So while the operation of an ax is to chop, its operation in the hands of a craftsman is to make benches or tables. The operation of making benches is unified. It's not properly attributed to either the ax or the craftsman independently of one another. Rather, each share in the operation of the other, even though the operation of the ax is subordinate to, it depends on that of the craftsman. So by analogy is the humanity of Christ to the divine person of the word. And just as the ax is raised to a higher dignity by the craftsman participating in the making of a bench because of its instrumental use, so the humanity of Christ is raised to a higher dignity participating in redemptive actions because it's the instrument, the nature of a divine person. One final piece of this idea is that the Holy Spirit sanctifies the humanity of Christ preparing it by grace to function as an instrument of the word of the Son of God. So Christ's humanity remains intact with all of its properties, but it's sanctified by the Spirit in ways that make it a fitting instrument for the saving mission of the Son of God. As Thomas Aquinas says, grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it. Um, and we can talk more about the perfections of Christ's humanity especially in relation to his human knowledge in the question time, if that's something that you're all interested in. Now this leads us to the third Christological principle. The doctrine of the communication of properties, um, this is also known as the communication of idioms or the communication of names, but we've been talking about properties. So we're gonna continue to talk about that. The doctrine of the communication of properties follows from these Christological insights as a way of emphasizing the unity of Christ while maintaining the dissimilarity of his natures. Because an action is an effect of the person by reason of the nature, again, persons act according to the natures, the properties of each nature are attributed to the one person of Christ. Um, this sounds complicated, but it's actually fairly straightforward. So hopefully that this will help us walk through this. So because Christ has a human nature, we can attribute the properties of that nature to the person of Christ. So this allows us to say things like, the son of God is born of Mary, or God suffered and died on the cross, right? Insofar as he is a divine person with a human nature, we can say these things truly about him in relation to his humanity. At the same time, we can attribute the properties of the divine nature to the person of Christ as well. And we can say things like, Jesus created all things, or the son of Mary exists eternally. Um, so we can truly say, things about the person of Christ, and we attribute the properties of both of his natures to him, truly. So we can highlight the reality of the incarnation and intensify its implications by using these kinds of phrases. And this is what the poets are doing. They're reveling in the paradox, right? They love saying things like God suffered and died on the cross. The son of Mary exists eternally, right? These things that sound paradoxical, mysterious, strange, what they're doing is they're applying the properties of one or the other of the natures to the person of Christ. Um, and therefore they're heightening the paradox. But that doesn't undermine the coherence of these statements. God as God in his divine nature 
could not truly be born or suffer. But if he existed as a man, then he could. Uh, let me see here. Here we go. Um, a human person could not exist eternally, but a divine person with a human nature could exist eternally as the creator of the cosmos. And again, this is important for upholding the integrity of the two natures. So it's not as if by becoming incarnate, the divine nature was diminished or gave up its properties. Rather, in the incarnation, God took up an additional limited finite mode of being. Now to understand why this matters, hopefully that felt fairly straightforward and maybe it seems obvious. Um, and so to see why it matters, it's helpful to consider it in relation to a major stream of 20th century thought called canonic Christology. Canonic Christology gets its name from the word kenosis in Philippians, and that means emptying. It says Christ emptied himself. Um, canonic Christology takes up its name from that. So stemming particularly from some early Lutheran theologians, canonic Christology names the widespread misconception that even if Jesus was divine in some sense, he could have only been truly human if his divinity was evacuated of its divine properties. So building upon a particular reading of the phrase, he emptied himself in Philippians 2, they think of the incarnation like this. So in the incarnation, Christ gives up the divine properties and he takes on the human properties. Um, God divests himself of his divine properties in order to live and act humanly. His divine nature is becoming a different nature. It's transformed and it becomes subject to all the limitations of human existence. Um, and so this is often worked out with a version of the communication of properties in which rather than ascribing the attributes of each nature to the person, the properties of each nature are cross attributed to each other. So they're ascribing the attributes of Christ's humanity to his divinity, and therefore the divinity of the word becomes a human nature through the incarnation. And so these theologians view transcendence as incompatible with the incarnation, and therefore insist that God must give up elements of his divinity in order to become human. Now, the majority of reforming Catholic theologians reject canonic Christology. But that's not to say that they ignore Philippians 2, which has always been a central Christological text. Rather, the emptying of Christ, or kenosis, has typically been understood, as it says in context, as taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, which is how Paul explains it. The emptying of the divine son involves the addition of a human nature. He emptied himself by taking up, labon, the form of a slave. Not, it's not the diminution of his divinity. And so I think the most hopeful way of thinking about canonic Christology is that it's actually giving us something mythological, like Hercules, specifically the Disney Hercules. I don't know if you've all seen this film, but what we have here in the, the bottom right corner is Hercules is a god, he's a divine nature, and these two demons have given him poison. Um, and basically they, they don't give him the, every last drop. And so because the one drop remained of the poison, he keeps his strength. And this is where we get the myth of Hercules, right? And so what's happened is, is, is you have a divine nature and you poisoned it and it's gotten rid of all its divine properties and now it just has human properties. Um, and so, right, so this is, this is mythology. This is, this is um, Greek mythology, and it's not what we believe to be true about Christ. Um, so that's the problem with this, this sort of approach to Christology. And so one helpful way of avoiding this mistake is to add qualifications to our statements. For example, we can say that Jesus hungers and thirsts insofar as he is human or in his humanity. And we can say that Jesus created the world insofar as he is divine or in his divinity. These qualifications are already implicit in most of what we say about Christ because properties are applied to him in virtue of one of his natures. That's simply how we talk about things. But we can make it explicit if we need to clarify. So as the church fathers noted, whether consciously or not, the communication of idioms and the idea of instrumentality are at work in scripture, in liturgy, in hymnody, in poetry, and so on. These things control how we talk about Christ in all these different contexts. Um, and so I want to consider just one example of this by turning to another poem, which delightfully revels in the paradox of the incarnation. Uh, this one by my friend and up until recently college chaplain, Malcolm Geit. 
Um, it's called Stones into Bread. This is part of a series that he did on the um, temptations of Christ. And this one specifically on the temptation to turn stones into bread. The fountain thirsts, the bread is hungry here. The light is dark, the word without a voice. When darkness speaks, it seems so light and clear. Now he must dare with us to make a choice. In a distended belly's cruel curve, he feels the famine of the ones who lose. He starves for those whom we have forced to starve. He chooses now for those who cannot choose. He is the staff and sustenance of life. He lives for all from one sustaining word. His love still breaks and pierces like a knife, the stony ground of hearts that never shared. God gives through him what Satan never could, the broken bread that is our only food. So here we can see both the communication of instrument, inst sorry, the communication of idioms or the communication of properties and the instrumentality of Christ's humanity at work. Um, so let's talk about that, right? So then the first line, the fountain thirsts, the bread is hungry here. So here we get the communication of idioms, right? So the fount, the fount of life, the divine person thirsts um, because in, in his human nature, he thirsts, right? So we're communicating the properties of the human nature to the person, the fountain thirst, and the bread, the bread of life, the eternal son of God, hungers in his human nature. And we see the instrumentality here. The thirst and hunger of Christ are redemptive because they're undertaken by a divine person, right? They're, the dignity of those actions is raised in a way that our, our suffering wouldn't be redemptive precisely because they're undertaken by a divine person. The word without a voice, this is where when, when Christ became an infant, the word infant means the infants without, wor without words, um, right? So the eternal word of God comes without words, taking on human flesh in the incarnation. In a distended belly's cruel curve, he feels the famine of the ones who lose. Here again, right? The, the eternal, the, the bread of life, um, the one who created all things that sustains them in being, he experiences hunger, um, for us because he's truly human in his human nature and that that hunger and that suffering is redemptive because it's this, uh, the hunger of a divine person um, and then here at the end of Malcolm writes God gives through him what Satan never could the broken bread that is our only food um, noting that as as happens throughout the New Testament um, right Satan promises things that he actually can't deliver um, and by, by not giving into that temptation, by being faithful, where we would be faithless, Christ actually delivers the things that Satan promised. Um, so so if, then we could say, who is it that experiences the genuine and undiminished reality of human suffering? It's the son of God, who is of one being with the father. And what's the manner in which he experiences this suffering as man? To insist that the son must suffer in his divine nature, which canonic theologians and others would try to argue, is simply a category mistake for this, this tradition. It would be to make the mystery incoherent, as Hick has charged, right? The idea that the eternal ground of being, who does not possess a body or physical senses, could suffer and die makes no sense. And the Christian theological response to that is, yes, that's true, unless he took on human flesh. And furthermore, if Jesus suffered in his divine nature, he would not be experiencing truly human suffering because he would then be suffering in a divine mode. But the whole point is that God took on human suffering, that he, as a divine subject, took on our mode of being so that he could share in our human suffering and redeem it. In and through his suffering and death, Christ offers obedience and love in place of our disobedience, thereby rendering us just. The human obedience of Christ is of infinite worth due to the dignity of the subject who undertakes the action of reparation, the Son of God. Christ's suffering and death are fully human in their mode, and they are salvific because they are undertaken by a divine person. And this is the great mystery of redemption, which we enter into so richly during Lent and Holy Week, contemplating the death and resurrection of Christ, and participating in the grace that flows from his sacrifice for us by the work of the Holy Spirit among us. Thank you. And yes, yeah, so brilliant. We're getting some questions in now. Um, 
So uh, one question um, that's come up Austin is, is there still disagreement um, among theolog theologians with regards to Christology or at most generally now agreed on the kind of Nicene um, Chalcedonian understanding of, of Christology? Yeah, this is a great question. I think uh, the, the 20th century was really a century of breaking away from this tradition. Um, and so you had a lot of theologians, Moltmann, Pannenberg, a number of really, really famous and influential theologians um, who, who sort of rejected this approach um, and tried to develop alternative approaches. And it, so it's really been a trajectory in the last 20 years, especially, um, to sort of recover the classical Nicene Chalcedonian tradition. Um, and, and there's been a number of reasons why that has happened. So it, but it's really a sort of movement back today. And so a number of the most important books on Christology, especially in the last 10 years, have really been about recovering this Chalcedonian tradition um, and, and, and really sort of rediscovering um, why it's so much stronger than these kind of alternatives that were developed um, more recently. Um, but so yeah, there's no, there's, it's certainly not a you know, unanimous thing, um, but the, where there's more difference, because I would say, you know, across the spectrum, so like, you know, Catholic, Reformed, Lutheran, Anglican theologians, um, a lot of, at least, well, maybe obviously my favorite ones, um, have all sort of moved back towards this, this kind of Chalcedonian approach. Um, and where the differences really lie is in that question about the, the grace and perfection of Jesus' human nature and what that looks like. Um, and there's there, that's especially where there's a lot of great diversity of approaches still, um, but that's really within then this, this kind of Chalcedonian paradigm. Fantastic, thank you. Um, another question has come in. Um, so there have been a number of attempts to illustrate the doctrine of the Trinity over the years, and most no notably the three-leaved shamrock, all seem to fall down in terracy. Is there any, is there a, any illustration which does work, um, either explaining the Trinity or Christ's nature? Yeah, this is a great question. I mean, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity, again, talking about the mysteries of the faith, right? And, and, and that was implicit in so much of what we were talking about when we, when we talk about the Son of God. Um, when I say that he's a person, um, we're talking Trinitarian terms, right? He's the, he's a, a, the Trinitarian person. Um, and that gets really complicated because um, the, right, the person and nature aren't really distinct in God. Um, the persons are processions. Um, and so when we're thinking of illustrating the Trinity, um, I think that inevitably every single illustration that we have is heretical, but it can say something true. And so this is often the case in what we're doing in theology is we're going to use analogies and we're going to use metaphors and we're going to use them to, to capture one element or one truth about the thing that we're talking about. Um, and whenever we think that we found the illustration or the metaphor that captures the whole thing, um, that's when we end up in heresy. But, but a lot of these things, um, you know, the, I mean, the shamrock, it has all kinds of problems with it, but it also says, in, in one sense, it says something true because it's, it's pointing to the unity of the persons of the Trinity, right? And so if we're thinking about, are the three persons one God, um, right? That's a, that's a kind of illustration that highlights that but it highlights it wrong. So the way that the, the leaves are one is not the way that the per divine persons are one. Um, and if we think that it is, then that's a problem. And so, yeah, so I would say, you know, always think if we're illustrating the Trinity, we're wrong, but we can say something true by these illustrations. And some, so sometimes we just need a bunch of them, but the point is to ask specific kinds of questions so that we can specify. And again, right, we're, we're trying to put that kind of, the boundaries around the mystery. Um, anything that dissolves the mystery and makes us think, oh, this is pretty straightforward, I've got it. Um, I understand how that would work. That, that's a problem, um, right? We're, but we, if we, we protect the mystery by specifying what, what it is that we mean. Um, yeah, so hopefully that's helpful. But it's a, it's a really good question. And it, it's always lying in the background of these Christological questions that we're asking. Fantastic, thanks very much. Um, we've had a really interesting question about, um, so obviously, this is a is sort of a hugely complex um, sort of area of theology, but how many of the difficulty or difficulties or complexities of this stem from language and where does like language and translation sort of come into this, this question? What yeah, this it's great. I mean, you know, studying Christology is excellent because it's really messy history. 
Um, and so, you know, especially that kind of early patristic debates, you know, you can read the sort of texts themselves, but when you read about everything that's happening around the texts, right, it's, it's politics and it's culture and it's language and there's so much happening. Um, and so that, which is really, really interesting. So I would encourage you if you're, you know, if you're interested in this area to sort of read into that history and the development. Um, and, and it really matters. It's really important. And this is the thing that when theologians, um, when, when we use theological language, um, we're using it analogically, right? So we're, these things, and we say, even, for example, persons and natures, you know, when I say I'm a person with a human nature, God is a person with a divine nature, that's, a, that's an analogy. I'm not saying those are the exact kind of thing and they apply, right? It, it, they apply analogically. And the reason that's important is because then it means that the words that I'm using, um, they have a particular meaning and they have a particular meaning because of how they're applied to me, but also because of my my culture and because of my language. And and those those kind of spec the the kind of cultural specificity of those things is one of the things that we're denying about them when we use them of God. Um, and so it, it does really matter when you're when you're you know in the early church when it was Latin speakers versus Greek speakers you're using different terms to think about these things. Um, person was one of those terms that was really difficult. The word we end up using hypostasis meant something different until they sort of developed it and said, let's make it mean this um, because we need a word for this. Um, and so, yeah, so always with theological language, it's, we wanna be really aware of where did we get these words? How do we use them in our regular speech? Is that how they're being used here? What other words are people using? Um, and so again, like really wanna specify, I mean, this is the, the biggest problem with person today is that after John Locke, we always think of person in terms of consciousness, right? A person is a center of consciousness. That's kind of our culture's approach. Um, and that's not what we were talking about today, right? A person is an act of being, a substantial act of being. Um, and so again, this the word person becomes a problem in Christology because of our how we use it in our language. Um, so yeah, it's, it's excellent, I think, to be asking those questions and thinking, you know, what am I importing to this? And what would it have meant to the people that were using it? Um, often that's most of the work of kind of doing theology well. Thank you. Um, can you recommend any other poems or meditative texts or pictures uh, which might be particularly good to reflect on um, Christology throughout Holy Week? Oh man, this is a, I, I have like folders full of these things, but I never know the names of them off the top of my head. Um, I mean, you know, so Malcolm Guide has that whole series that is really good on the temptations of, of Christ. And so that's, I mean, particularly for Lent then relevant. Um, there is a series. I can't think of any off the top of my head, unfortunately, which I should be able to. Um, yeah, I had a couple in mind, but I can't, I can't remember what they're called. I'm sorry. <laughs> I remember Malcolm Guy, that's one I'll, I'll... Yeah. <laughs> um, so another question has come up. Um, you said that God is immutable and impassable as if that's axiomatic, um, but, but it's not debatable. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is a great question. And this is going to be a major difference. So like the canonic theologians are going to absolutely say that's debatable. Um, and, and this is a really interesting, largely philosophical question well, kind of philosophy and theology blur here. Um, but, but yeah, so, so we're, we need to ask questions about um, what do we believe to be true about God and what would, what would he have to be like for that to be the case? Um, and so I, I, I think the Christian tradition, the classical Christian tradition absolutely takes those things as axiomatic. They argue for them, um, but they also, they, they, they just take them as axioms. They, for them, it would not make any sense to say anything different. Um, and I think that they're right about that. Um, I think that that stems from, um, from ancient Israelite confessions of the one God um, and, and the fact that he is the creator of all things. Um, I think that these things absolutely are part of what the Judeo-Christian tradition means by God. Um, but those, those things get really questioned, especially into the, the 20th century. Um, and so there are really interesting discussions happening, especially in relation to Hegelian thought and then existentialist thought. Um, and and th those conversations are really fascinating um, and, and I, I really enjoy them. Um, but I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that the classical Christian tradition has this right. 
Um, and so, but yeah, so that's, that's, that's again, like I started with those as axioms because they're axioms for the classical tradition. Um, if they weren't axioms, then you would approach Christology differently, um, that you would have very different sort of, you know, basic principles that you're working with. Um, and so that's always something to keep in mind when someone's saying something different about Christ, um, you know, what, what different things are they assuming and why? Um, but it's one of the reasons why Christology is such a big part of the Christian tradition is because those things are axiomatic beliefs about God, because if they weren't, in some ways, it becomes much less complex, right? If, if God can suffer and God can, you know, all of these kinds of things, then, then we can just say, well, then he just did that in Jesus and it's not actually that interesting. Um, and so for the classical tradition, what's, what's really interesting about the incarnation, what's, what's incredible about the mystery at the heart of our faith is that God doesn't suffer. Um, and that God doesn't change because he is the eternal ground of the existence of all things, right? Um, so yeah, so I think that's absolutely a good question. And that's, um, yeah, something that I, I, and I'd say it's valuable to make arguments in favor of that. So I've stated it as an axiom, but not because I think that it's not worth discussing just because I didn't want to talk to you all for three hours. Um, but that would be a whole nother talk that would be really, really interesting and worthwhile, I think. Fantastic, thanks very much. Um, is it likely that most Christians in the past and present have never understood these questions fully? And the one person, um, um, does anyone kind of fully understand? And is it is it still okay to come to Christ as a as a child without without this understanding? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, this is the you know this is a perennial question in the Christian faith. Is um, you know we have these really complex doctrinal statements. Um, and, and beliefs and, and creeds and these kinds of things. Um, but the majority of Christians that have ever lived, you know, it's not like all of them were highly educated or, you know, had studied all of these things. Um, and so I think this is really where the, the church is important to, to have in mind. Um, so, you know, the, the point of, of the creeds, it's something that we confess, um, but it's not something that sort of every single Christian has to understand in order to be a Christian, right? The main thing that these guardrails are doing is helping the church as a whole remain the church, right? And so the teaching of the church, um, the people who, who are leading and who are teaching do need to understand these things. Um, and it's helpful for them to articulate them, um, but it's not that every single individual Christian needs to be able to fully understand all of these details in order to count as a Christian, um, right? But, but it's valuable for them, right? So, I mean, part of my argument tonight was that, you know, understanding this can be valuable as we enter Holy Week because I remember, you know, in the past, you know, going, sitting through sermons in Holy Week and thinking, I still, I just can't, you know, what are they talking about? Like, I feel like this is just contradictory. I don't know how to make sense of the idea that Christ is divine and that he died on the cross and what's happening here. Um, and so it's really helpful to be able to specify what the Christian tradition means by that, especially if you're encountering people who are challenging or critiquing that, like some of the people that I mentioned. Um, but at the same time, absolutely, right? Christ accepts us as children. He doesn't say you need to understand my person and natures in order to come to me. He says, come to me. Um, and so I think we, you know, these things are absolutely not barriers to us coming to Christ, um, but rather they're, they're things that the church offers to us as aids to our prayer and our contemplation, right? That, that, that kind of thing. And so I think that's the, the sort of place to, to put them in and we're, when we're thinking about what, you know, what's the purpose of, of all of this theologizing. Um, yeah, and then particularly because in the modern world, we have a lot of different types of Christianity. Um, it can be really helpful to sort of center back to, you know, what does the Christian tradition teach about this? Um, I think that can be, yeah, it can be really helpful. Thank you. Um, how do different um, Christologies affect our faith and Christian actions? And, and why does it matter what we believe about Christ's nature? Yeah, this is this is great. I mean, I think um, there's so much that can be said here. Um, you know, one of the one of the questions that we we have to ask ourselves is, we're called to be like Christ, right? In some ways, he's sort of set up as the example of what a human life should look like. But at the same time, we're told, right, if Christ is divine. Um, and so we end up with these really interesting questions of, well, are we supposed to be divine? Are we supposed to be able to do the stuff that Jesus does? Like, what is what things are we following? Are we supposed to be like him? And in what ways is he, are we supposed to be not like him, right? Because key to our confessions of him being who he is, is that he is and does things that we can't do. 
Um, and so I think that always raises these questions for Christians of, you know, what is, you know, what does that look like? I, I don't feel like I can go out and, and miraculously heal people. Um, I, I may be called to, to pray for the spirit to do those things, but that's not, you know, and so does that keep me from being Christ-like? Um, and so in some ways, this really helps us because what we're, what we're recognizing is, um, you know, on the one hand, Christ is fully human, um, but because he's a divine person and because the spirit sort of transforms his human nature, um, sanctifies his human nature, um, he's going to do things that we can't do. I mean, he's, he's sinless, right? And we're not sinless. Um, and so it helps us, I think, specify that, um, right, Christ is the, the perfect picture of humanity. He's not the picture of humanity that any of us are going to attain to. Um, I mean, I remember as a, as a little kid, someone, I, I got in trouble and, um, and I remember someone telling me like, oh, now you've sinned. And I was like, man, like, I, I thought I was doing so good. I'm like, you know, I was like seven years old. And I was like, I feel like I could have just kept that going. And I could have been like Jesus, um, you know, and just not realizing that like, that's not, that's not what we're, that's not the issue. We, like, we've all sinned and we, um, and so, so these kinds of things are, but also, but also questions about um, who is God and who is the God that we pray to and what, how does Jesus relate to him? Um, I think these are really actually pressing kind of spiritual questions that we have. Um, and so the doctrine of Christ, I think, can help us sort of clarify what, what we believe to be the case about that. Um, there's probably a lot more, but that's what springs to mind, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, is, is there a sense in which saying um, it's a divine mystery is a sort of get out of jail free card, which means that we don't have to worry about finding a satisfactory answer to these questions? Yeah, this is great. This is, um, I, I mean, this is exactly the thing as, as theologians, you never want to just go for that, right? You never want to say this is complex. It's a mystery. Um, so we're always pushing and pushing in, into these mysteries and saying, you know, can, can we be clearer about this? Um, you know, what resources do we have to sort of specify what is the case here? Um, but just as important is not explaining away the mysteries. Um, so just as important is to, and this is this is why, um, you know, great theologians are really wise. And this is the one of the things that they're able to do really well is to recognize, right? We've strayed into territory where we're, we're explaining things that we actually don't know what we're talking about versus where, so, so this is the, so, when we do theology, right, a lot of our first principles that we're working with are things that are revealed to us in scripture. Um, and so if we're speaking of something in light of what's revealed to us in scripture, um, we can take that to a certain degree, right? But if we're speaking about something that's not spoken about in scripture, um, then there's there oftentimes where we can just be making things up, right? Um, and so, so, so these are the kinds of questions, right? Sometimes it's a mystery because it hasn't been revealed to us to explain it. Um, sometimes it's a mystery because, right, we've just reached the limits, reached the limits of what our language can do to say what's happening here. And sometimes it's a mystery because we we're lazy and we actually should be able to specify this more and we haven't done it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think those things are always open. So, um, right, there's a chance that at some point I've said that's a mystery and we can't explain it more. And actually maybe we could, right? And that's always a good question. Um, but on the flip side, there are many times when you come across someone explaining something theologically and actually they don't know what they're talking about. And that is something that maybe is more mysterious than they've allowed. Um, but yeah, so I would, so this is, I think that's, um, it's always, a, it's always a really important thing to be keeping in mind. Um, even, you know, as we're reading scripture and these kinds of things, it, it comes up constantly. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, so Jesus showed both pure love and his earthly life. And is love, the love that he showed, that both a human love and a divine love? And how can you kind of reconcile those two sort of loves? Yeah, so this is great. This is, uh, so one of the ways that we talk about God is that we talk about divine perfections. Um, and so what we would say is that there, there are things, things that we apply to God, God is in himself, right? So God is being himself um, and we participate in being from him, but also God is goodness. God is love. Um, and so unlike when we apply things to us, um, you could say that I am loving, but I'm not love itself. Um, God is love itself. And interestingly, when we're using these words, we're using them analogically, but sort of the other way. And we're saying, right, love, whatever love means is God. Um, and I'm using it analogously to myself. 
Um, and so when I'm loving, that's sort of an analogy to what God is, but it doesn't actually reach what God is. Um, and so in the incarnation, we have these two sort of come together, right? So, so humans can sort of participate in love by, by, by loving um, and acting lovingly. And Christ himself, who is love itself, then acts in a human mode. Um, and so we essentially get, you know, the highest picture of what human love can look like because love itself is the person who's acting in that human nature. And so we get this love in a, per in a perfectly human mode. Um, and so I think that's, that's really at the heart of um, the mystery of, of Christ um, in many ways is that he's revealing to us who God is, um, but he's revealing it to us in a human mode. Um, so in, in a mode that we can understand um, more and understand um, in the way that we understand other things. So, so, that, so, right, so this is when we say that God reveals himself to us in Christ. Um, God is love, God is goodness, God is being itself. And he's revealed that to us um, in a human mode in the incarnation. Um, and so what we see in Christ is, you know, the, the sort of human reflection of that eternal and perfect, perfect love. And fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, I was also wondering that there does seem to be at points in the Bible where like the human nature of Christ is almost more stressed. And I suppose I'm thinking particularly of like Christ in the temple and his anger and that sort of aspect and whether that's though that's kind of this intentional moment where a more human side is, is presented or whether it's still it's supposed to be a kind of continuity or or how that's sort of explored it in scripture yeah this is so uh, i mean the that that kind of or think about the garden of gethsemane this sort of prayer you know not my will but your will be done um i mean that's the prayer where we get when the classical christian tradition says that christ has two wills um that's where they're getting that from right he has a human will and a divine will and this is really like peak mystery of Christ when we're talking about his wills. Um, but, but basically what we're saying is, so Christ sort of knows his divine identity um, and therefore his will is aligned with his divine will um, because, if we, um, because although he is fully human, um, right, he, he, he's aware of who he is as the divine son um, and therefore he can align his will, which if the will is an appetite for the good, um, right, then he knows the good, he knows the Father, and so therefore his will can be perfectly sort of aligned toward the good. Um, when we do bad, it's because our mind has sort of given our will something as if it was the good, but it's not, right? We've misapprehended what's the ultimate good um, in a situation. And so his will is always aligned with, what, with the good, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't experience all the passions that we experience. So he experiences fear and he experiences pain, and there's things in us, right, even when we know for sure this is the right thing to do, we still feel terrified, we still feel sick, we still feel angry. Um, and so, you know, we see Jesus sort of living that, um, right? He's, he's, he's always has his will in line with the divine will. He's always acting in line with the divine will, but in a human mode. And that, that looks like that. And so, um, I mean, one of the reasons that's important is just to say, you know, what we're not called to do is just be like passive and not feel anything and not do anything, right? Like that's not the perfection of humanity. Um, and, and the fact that we have passions and experience like this, um, those aren't, those things aren't evil in themselves. Um, and so I think we see that sort of taken up and redeemed in, in Christ's actions. But again, it's somewhat mysterious, right? It's not something we can, it's not something I can fully explain. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, for answering those questions so brilliantly. Um, um, and, um, just a really brilliant and interesting talk.